for the last several weeks, we've been talking about uh, the book of Colossians, and we were talking about what must have seemed to be crazy to the, to the Christians who first heard this, uh, about things like that there's only one God, and that, and that God became a human being, and that this God who became a human being died, and he rose again, and, and now there's a way that we, can, that we can have a relationship with God through him. There's a way that we can be forgiven. There's a way that we can be changed, and and, and we have the power through Christ to become a, a new person. In the passage that Lori read earlier uh, about that the Son is the image of the invisible God, and twice it says in Colossians that God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in Christ in bodily form. This, this must have sounded absolutely ludicrous, whether you were a Jew or a Gentile, to those first Christians in Colossae. And, and next week, I'm going to end this little series, and we're going to talk about um, what I think is one of the most ignored types of Scripture there is. At the very end of Colossians, you'll see that, that Paul has sort of a, a thank you note, a, a long thank you note to several people. And he does this in almost all of his letters, and we're going to look at who those people are in this list that he gives us at the end of Colossians and, and going to learn a little bit about their stories. Um, but today... I want to talk about something that I think is, frankly, it's often neglected as well. And um, let me ask you a question first, though. Have you ever had somebody try to share the gospel with you? And I'm just, there's no other way to say it. I'm just going to say it like this, and it doesn't sound good, but they were just weird. Like, they were weird people. Yeah, you're all judging me, but you know what I'm talking about. So, so I'm sitting in the mall one day several years ago, and, and there's the little uh, carpeted area with seats around it, and I'm sitting there minding my own business, waiting for Lori to get out of the, out of the candle store. And, um, and so, so anyway, I see this guy at the corner of my eye talk to this other person, and he pulls out a deck of cards, and in my mind I'm thinking, I know, like I know what this guy is doing. And I had, had, to, had the thought, should I get up and leave or should I just hope that he doesn't come over to me? And, and pretty soon, the one person he's talking to got up and left and then he'd come over to me and I knew what he was doing. Like he was going to witness to me. He was going to tell me about the Lord using this deck of cards. I don't know if you've ever had somebody pull this out on you. If you've done this yourself, please understand, I'm, like, I'm just telling you my, my experience. And um, it's kind of a weird way. I won't get into how it works, but there's, that's something that people used to use. Um, he didn't get anywhere with the deck of cards, and so he pulled out this fake million-dollar bill. Like, that's another thing that sometimes people use to, to start conversations that hopefully will lead to the Lord. And, and I, you know, I didn't have the heart to tell him I was a pastor, and so I just smiled at him and said thank you and, and then kind of moved on. Um, all kinds of ways that people try to tell others about the Lord. Lori, Lori got uh, an, an envelope in the mail the other day, had our address, her name on it, and um, opened it up, and it was a handwritten letter from a, a, a a Christian person, actually, they were Jehovah's Witness with a tract in it, imploring her to start going to the Kingdom Hall and to not burn in hell. And it's like, well, that's just a, that's a really engaging way to witness to somebody. I've, I've been in public bathrooms and I've seen Christian gospel tracts stuck up on the toilet, on the urinal, you know, you're kind of a captive audience there. And um, just all kinds of things that that, that people use. When I was a student at Indiana University, probably one of the weirdest people was this guy named Brother Louie. I think I've told you about Brother Louie before, but his thing was he would sit out in the quad, dressed in kind of like, I don't know if you've ever seen the, mu the movie musical Music Man, but kind of 1920s or whatever it is sort of, sort of outfit, and he would sit and engage the students as we walked by, and, and he would tell us basically that we're all going to hell, and, the, and he would engage us, and we would try to talk to him and argue with him, and and the more bombastic he got, the better he thought that he did and, until there was just the shouting matches between this guy and, and the students. And I just thought to myself, even though as a new Christian, I thought there's got to be a better way. Like there's got to be a better way to go about telling people about the Lord. And so this morning, and what Paul wants to tell us about is, is for lack of a better title, this is the title, and I don't have it posted anywhere because if because I'll deny it if somebody's upset about it and they said that this is what I titled this message, but how to share the gospel without being weird. Like, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And some of us, some of us, we, we have a longer way to go because some of us are weirder than others, and include, I said us, okay? 
And so we're going to look at this, and, and because this is like everything that Paul has talked about, it's all important, but it all goes toward the fact that we need to be sharing our faith with other people. And if we don't, like if we don't do that, if we're not concerned about that, then we're kind of missing the point of, of what Jesus did when he came. Uh, theologian Carl Henry once said, the gospel is only good, uh, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. Because if the gospel, the good news, doesn't reach other people before it's too late, then it really isn't good news. And so what Paul does as he, as he moves toward the conclusion of this letter is he, he wants to help us, help us to know how to tell people about Jesus without coming off in a, in a wrong way. And so I'm going to go just over kind of a few simple steps we gleaned from this passage. And the passage is Colossians um, uh, chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. And this is what Paul writes. He says, so devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful, and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may declare it clearly as I should. And he says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, and make the most of every opportunity. And let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer every one. So I kind of want to just pick, pick a couple things out of that and just lay this out in a few easy, kind of easy nuggets. And the first one would be this, that, that we need to make sure that we're viewing every person we meet as somebody who Jesus is pursuing. If they, if they are not a believer in Christ, this is somebody that Jesus wants to pursue, wants to have a relationship with. And Paul said, now that you know, Colossians, what, what he's done for us, you need to be really, really concerned about passing this on to others. And, and so he says in verse 5 of this passage, be wise. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. And he's talking about people who are outside the faith. Make the most of every opportunity, he says. And so Jesus' job was, was to open the way back to God for sinful humanity. Our job, our job is to help people understand that, to help people find their way back to God. And I just know that sometimes I forget, I forget, and probably sometimes you forget, that, that these are people that Jesus loves. We forget that God is still pursuing people, that God is still, is still chasing after people, and it's not like we're doing this alone. This is not just what we do, but it's what we do with God. And so in following him, we need to partner with him in trying to, trying to get others to understand this. And, and so Paul says in, in Colossians 4, 5, be wise. Be wise. Understand this. And be wise in the way you act toward those who are outside the faith and make the most of every opportunity. Everybody, if they are not a Christian, everybody through the course of the day or the week that we lock eyes with is a person who is being pursued by God. And as his ambassadors, we need, to, we need to have a part in making him known to them. And we need to view everybody through that lens. And this is hard to do. Like, I'm just going to tell you, this is hard to do, right? Everybody, that, 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 that annoying guy in front of you in the line at the gas station who's taking forever because he's trying to pick out which lottery he, tickets he wants. That guy who cut you off in traffic and made you almost wreck. That lady in the store with young children and she's berating them to the point that you want to call DSF on them. That coworker who you think would never in a million years accept an invitation to visit church with you. Everybody, everybody, we have to see them through the lens of somebody that God wants to have a relationship with. And this is not easy. We get hurried, we get annoyed, we get lost in our own world and our own thoughts and, and it's so difficult. But I think this is the most important thing. We've got to view every person we meet as somebody that Jesus wants and who needs Jesus. And then from that, another thing is to build a, a genuine friendship over time and seek to remove barriers. Now, I'm not saying that we've got to do this with every single person we meet. That would be impossible. But God's going to bring people into our lives, and it's going to be pretty clear if we're at all spiritually sensitive that this is somebody that God, that God really is pursuing and wants to partner with us in that. So in a few weeks from now, I'm going to start a little series on friendship. 
Um, I, I'm going to close the series next week. The two weeks after that, just to give you a little preview, Mark is going to uh, preach the next two weeks uh, while I'm on vacation getting a kid married off. And then when I get back, I'm going to do this little series on friendship. And it's really, really important because this is, this is how we influence people for Christ without seeming weird. Because I'm sure none of you have friends who are weird, right? Like that just doesn't happen. And so, so we want to be friends with people. And so he says these things, you know, pray for us that God may open a door for our message. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt. Jesus said in the most famous thing that he said in the Sermon on the Mount that we are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. And so what does that mean to be salt, seasoned with salt? Now, Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But then he says, but do this with gentleness and respect. See, that's, that's the grace and salt part, Gen gentleness and respect. That, that we need to have people know that we respect them and love them, that we're not talking down to them. And so with everybody we meet, we need to try to be welcoming and engaging. And then when we, when we build friendships with people, let our conversations, if they're not a Christian especially, let our conversations always be full of grace, seasoned with salt. Like this described Jesus better than anything else. Luke 4.22, this says that everybody spoke well of him and they were amazed at his gracious words that came from his lips, seasoned with salt. Full of grace. What does it mean to be seasoned with salt? What, is, what does salt do? For those of you out there, probably mostly men, who always get yelled at because you put too much salt on your food, like what is salt there to do? Well, it enhances the taste of the food a whole lot. Amen? Like, like, like it enhances the taste of the food, but it also kind of was meant back in that day anyway to create a, a thirst, to create thirst, to create a hunger, a desire for more. So important, so important is salt. One little boy said, well, salt is the thing that makes food taste bad when you don't have it. Salt is that thing which makes food taste bad when you don't have it. Now, you can think about that over lunch as you're salting your food. But, but I agree with that. Food without salt is just not good. Salt ought to, be, ought to be the main ingredient of our speech, but too often it's the missing ingredient. But with Jesus, people wanted to hear more. Grace and salt. I think the best example of this and the longest recorded conversation we have between Jesus and an unbeliever is when, he, is when he's waiting for the disciples by this well. And he's in Samaria. And, and he, he's just, it's a noonday. It's the, the heat of the sun. And yet he's waiting for his disciples. And this woman comes by. And we read about this in John chapter 4, the woman at the well. And the woman comes to the well by herself, and we get just this, this, this amazing master class in how to, talk, how to talk to people with grace and with salt. And so she comes up, and Jesus starts off by asking her, hey, hey, can I have a drink? Can I have a drink? This would have immediately kind of set her back and piqued her interest. Well, well you're, you're, a, you're a man, I'm a woman, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. You, like, you shouldn't be asking me for, for water. And Jesus said to her, well, if, if you knew who it is that asked you for a drink, you'd ask him again, and he'd have given you living water, and you'll never be thirsty again. Now, the woman had to go there every day, probably, to get, well, to get water from that well. There's a whole lot of reasons why she was probably doing it in the middle of the day, not the early morning. I'm not going to get into those. But the bottom line was that she had to do that every single day. And she's like, he's talking about a a, a water that will never go away, that will, I'll never be thirsty again. I want to know about that. So she says, sir, give me some of this water so that I'll not be thirsty and I won't have to keep coming back here. And Jesus says, well, okay, but why don't you go, why don't you go back and call your husband and then come back and we'll talk about it. And, and she said, well, I have, I have no. And Jesus says, well, you're right when you say that you don't have any husband. In fact, the man that you're living with isn't, you're not married to him, and you've had five husbands. And, and so he, he doesn't like make her feel bad. He just gets, he gets, gets the truth out there. He doesn't say, okay, here, let me give you some water. He, he's thinking strategically, and he says, why don't you go get your, go get your husband? 
He knows that this is going to open up a, a stream of conversation that he'll be able to use. And she says, well, I don't have any husband. Jesus says, well, you're right. Well, at that time, she, it was getting too real for her. The conversation was getting uncomfortable for her. And she wanted to change the subject. Sometimes when we, when we try to, to talk to people or to lead the conversation in that direction, people don't want to go there. It's going to become kind of uncomfortable. And sometimes we just got to drill down. And so Jesus says, Jesus says, no, you're right. She said, well, sir, I can see, I, I can see you're a prophet. Let me, let me ask you this question. So our ancestors worshiped on this mound, but you Jews say that the only place you can worship is, on, is in Jerusalem. What do you say? She's trying to change the subject from her situation and her life and her need to some obscure, really, relatively unimportant uh, theological discussion. And Jesus is like, okay, I'll engage that for a moment, but watch how he brings it back around. He says, well, she says, well, I, I, he says, the time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman says, well, I know the Messiah is coming, and when he comes, he'll explain it all to us. And Jesus is like, aha. He says, well, I, I, the one, the one speaking to you, like I am, I am he. And he creates this thirst in her for more. He engages her in conversation. He is full of grace. He knows her lifestyle. He knows where she's been, what she's done. He knows the reason probably she's there at the middle of the day is because she's ashamed to be around other people. And yet he doesn't, like he doesn't make her feel bad about that. But he engages her, brings out the truth, directs the conversation back to himself. And it's awesome how he does that. But he created, he created a thirst. And, and, and that's what we need to do. We need to, we need to talk with grace and with salt in such a way that we're not going to turn people off. Now, I always got to say this because this is so true. Like, we could be the best at this. We could maybe even in our day and time be Jesus ourselves, speaking with grace and truth and salt and all these things. And yet, the gospel is still going to be a stumbling block to some. They're just not going to believe. They're not going to want to believe. But if, if, if studies that have been done recently show us and are any indication, I mean, people are more open today than ever to wanting to know spiritual truth and reality and, and what, what is the real thing about God. It says in that passage in John 4 with this woman that Jesus, they begged him to stay two more days. So it says that Jesus stayed two more days and it says that many, many believed. Many believed because he was, he was full of grace and truth and he spoke with, with salt in a way to get their interest. No, so I, I came across this several years ago, and it's just kind of titled Ten Commandments to Make Conversation Full of Grace and Salt. Uh, Ten Commandments to, to Make Conversation Full of Grace and Salt. I thought I'd go down these uh, real quickly here, and so there's ten of them. The first one, first one is don't do what I feel like I've been doing up here. Don't ramble. Like, don't, don't ramble. When you're talking to somebody, make your point and finish, or make your thought, then finish, and stop talking for a while. Like, don't be afraid if there's some silence. Don't just keep talking and talking and talking to fill up silence like sometimes preachers do, right? Don't ramble. Don't, don't be like preachers. Like, that's a bad thing to do, right? Number two, be interested in others. Be interested in other people. And this is, this is not just if you're trying to get people to listen to the gospel, but this is just in general. Don't talk about yourself all the time. Ask questions about them. Know, want to know about their lives and ask questions about them. And, and especially if they've got kids, ask questions about their kids. And, 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 and this is the, the key to why so many people love Jesus. I call this, I call this the Elwood P. Dowd principle. So Elwood P. Dowd, some of you older folks might know, it's an old play way back in the day I was in it in high school about this guy, Elwood P. Dowd, who's a little off his rocker because he sees an invisible rabbit. And yet everybody loves Elwood P. Dowd. Like people just loved him. And one of the reasons that they loved him was because he always, always talked about other people. He always asked questions about other people. Well, how's your job going? Well, that must be really interesting. And you know as well as I do, people love to talk about themselves. The Elwood P. Dowd principle, when I was in this play in school, I was that character, and our drama teacher made us for a day go around school in, in, in character. 
So I had to go around school that entire day looking up at the six-foot invisible rabbit and talking to the six-foot invisible rabbit. Felt like an absolute fool. But by the time the play came around, I felt pretty comfortable in Elwood P. Dowd character. Like I was probably nicer than I usually was. In fact, when when the play was over and I started being myself again, my girlfriend at the time looked at me. She said, Chris, I think you ought to go back to being Elwood P. Dowd all the time, right? And so, but, but ask people about them. Just don't be, don't be talking about yourself all the time. Kind of corollary to that, be a good listener. Again, give, give people time to response. Don't butt in. Little things like make eye contact when they're talking, not in agreement with them, or, or maybe even occasionally interrupt them just to clarify what they were saying so they'll know that you are listening to them. Probably worst of all, don't look over somebody's shoulder, but look them in the eye. Preachers, we have a hard time doing this. We're, we're talking to people in the lobby, and we kind of want to see who's there and whatever, and so we have a tendency to kind of look away. And I've had so many people tell me and call me on that for doing that. And I say, I'm sorry, it's, it's so hard to do. But when you're talking to somebody, indicate that you're listening to them by, by making eye contact with them. Be a good listener. I got a problem with that. I really do. I I was on a phone conversation with a friend of mine from California, I don't know, a few years ago. And um, I hadn't talked to her in a while, and I love her. She's pretty influential in me becoming a Christian. And she's talking and telling me this story, and I thought that I could, like, do something on my computer and listen to her at the same time. And she's telling me the story about her son, and he did this and this and that and the other thing, and I'm kind of looking and reading my email, and yeah, okay, okay. And she tells me something, and I said, oh, that's awesome. And she says, Chris, are you listening to me? Like, I lied. I'm sorry. I did. Like, I I said, why? She said, Chris, I just told you that my younger son has just run away and we can't find him. And you said, wow, that's awesome. You weren't listening to me, were you? I said, I, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't. And I, I apologized, and I profusely called her back later to apologize. And, and she was upset. And she goes, she goes, I'm just telling you this, Chris, because you're a pastor. She said, don't ever do that to somebody in your church. And so I, I try to always listen, but sometimes I'm not a good listener. Another thing is to use humor occasionally. Use humor occasionally to lighten the mood. Sometimes, and I'm guilty of this, I try to use humor too much. I get uncomfortable. I get nervous. I try to cover it over with humor. Sometimes my humor crosses a line into sarcasm, and that's not a good thing. So, so if, if you have this ability, use humor occasionally. It, it provides salt. That, that is a good thing in moderation. Uh, with that, watch your tone. Watch your tone. Again, I have a tendency to sarcasm, and that's not good. I have a tendency to complain and whine and be negative. I'm just being honest with you. Some of you are like, well, we've known it, Chris. I'm glad that you finally know it as well, right? So watch, like, watch your tone when you're, when you're talking to people, when you're trying to engage them in a conversation. This is a huge one. Respect body space. Respect body space. Seinfeld, the great show Seinfeld, made a, made a thing of the close talker, right? The person that gets right up in your face and, and talks, and, and they don't understand not just social distance, but comfortable distance, right? I don't know if you've ever seen a baseball game when, a, when, when, when the, maybe the dugout empties out, and the teams are fighting, and the manager goes up to the umpire, and they, like, get right in each other's face. Like, that. that's too close, all right? Don't be a close talker, but... But respect body space. Learn how to, like, read somebody's body language. Like, you know, I mean, if they keep walking backward and you're walking toward them, that's probably an indication right there, right? Read body language. Be careful, you know, about about, um, shaking somebody's hand. We've all probably had people shake our hand. We thought they'd never let go. And we're like, okay, this is great, but I got to go now, right? Um, Respect body space. That's really, really important. Another one that people almost always mess up on, like all the time, mess up on this, don't exaggerate. People are always, all the time, exaggerating about everything, and like nobody wants to be around somebody that is always exaggerating some experience they've had. Um, Like the, the bragger, right? Some people exaggerate all the time. Some people always try to top your story with their story. And while you're telling them something, they're in their mind thinking about, well, what can I say to top what they're telling me? 
Again, we have TV to thank for this. The, uh, Saturday Night Live, many years ago, had a sketch repeatedly with Kirsten Wig, and she was playing this lady. I don't remember what her name was, but she was always at a party trying to top somebody's story, right? Just always bragging and exaggerating about, about something. Um, don't exaggerate. Uh, number eight, this is pretty easy to understand. Be enthusiastic. Be happy to talk to them. Or at least work really hard to pretend to be happy to talk to them, right? Number nine, quit when it's time to quit. Again, read people's body language, right? There are some people, we know we got close talkers. There are some people that we call slow leavers, right? They're, they just don't get it when, like when it's time to move on. And probably we've all had this experience, maybe when you were kids, I know that I did, and I've talked to a lot of other people my age, and maybe you're with your family, and you're at a, 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 the, the friend's house, right, and, and the parents are doing their thing talking, and you were with your friends, the kids, and you're all doing the thing, and all of a sudden, out of the next room, your parents called you, okay, get your coats on, it's time to go. We're like, no, we don't want to go. We don't want to go. We want to stay here longer. And I'm like, come on, it's time to go. It's time to go. No, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. Finally, at the threat of our life, I guess, I don't know, we finally get our coats on and we're standing by the front door. Mom and dad are still in there talking. Come on, it's time to go. Yeah, we'll be right there. We'll be right there. We're standing there. It's about quarter past midnight by this time. Come on, it's time to go. It's time to go. No, we'll be right there. Like we've fallen asleep and by the front door and they got to pick us out to the car. And, but, but know when it's time to quit. Know when it's time, in a sense, to get your coat on and, and wrap up the conversation. And then, most importantly, in, in this conversation, again, if, if this is something that is with an unbeliever and you're trying to influence them or trying to share the gospel with them, find a way to exalt Jesus. Find a way to turn the conversation back to Jesus. Um, Find, find a, some need they have in their life or, or tell, them, tell them a time when, when God really helped you through something or a or scripture that was particularly meaningful to you. I'm not saying hit them over the head with a gospel tract or deck of cards, but I'm saying tell them about your experience. Just do anything to turn the conversation back to Jesus. Okay, we know, we know this works because isn't this exactly what Jesus did? The woman tried to get him sidetracked into some unimportant theological distraction. And yet he brought the focus back to himself. And we need to do that as well. We need to bring the focus back to Jesus. And I think people today are more open than ever. I was reading this article last week that said that for whatever reason, now more than ever, we have a friendship problem in our country, and particularly men. I'll talk more about this in the series in a few weeks, but, but studies show that we have fewer and fewer and fewer close, close friends, people that we can call on a moment's notice to know that they'll be there for us. And, and we've got to become that to people. We've got to build friendships and try to overcome barriers to faith by being full of grace and making them thirst and hunger for more. Maybe you've heard this in past years, people we used to call it lifestyle evangelism or, or consumer evangelism is the, is the buzzword now. In other words, everybody has to be a consumer. Everybody has to, to, to go get stuff at the store. Everybody's got to go to the gas station. Everybody's got to sit by the sideline at a kid's sports game. Or everybody's got to go to parent-teacher conferences or a doctor's appointment. In other words, in the context of our daily lives, watch for openings. And pray that God would open, open them. See, there aren't, these aren't places that we're just to go mindlessly and go do things we want to do. These are our, our mission field. And I know, it, man, it's hard to keep that mentality. It is so hard. I heard this last week. Somebody said, disciples of Jesus are missionaries from the end of our driveways to the end of the world. Now, a lot of times we're really good at the end of the world. Like, we're going to, uh, I didn't see you guys sitting out there, Rich and Ian, I'm glad you're here. We're going to have prayer for them in a while. A uh, couple of weeks, they're going to be going off to, to Guatemala. And um, I'll just share this with you. I've been getting some messages from my friends in Haiti. And, man, they say, Pastor Chris, tell people to pray for us. Tell people to pray for us. It's so hard. Now, listen, that president was not a good president. But it just threw that, that place in such chaos. And, and we've packed food for them. We've sent missionary teams for them. And now we need, to, we need to pray for them. But sometimes it's easier to pray for people hundreds and hundreds of miles away than to understand that we're to be missionaries from the end of our driveways 
to the end of the world. And this is where we kind of get confused with this one here. That evangelism most of the time isn't a, isn't a one-time event. It's not a one-time event. People often think, well, we, we talked to somebody, we shared the gospel, so, so we need to ask them right now, do you want to become a Christian right now? And, like, and if, they, if they hesitate or if they say they don't want to, then we just give up and move on to the next person. But scripturally, evangelism is a process. And you say, well, Chris, in the, in the book of Acts, the apostles shared the gospel and people responded right away. Peter preached the gospel and 3,000 responded. Well, this is the book of Acts and we're not the apostles. But listen to what the apostle Paul did say. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul said, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. God has been making it grow. It's a, it's a process. There are going to be several people usually involved in a person's decision to finally become a Christian. But this is a mistake that we make. We hear these stories of great evangelists, and they go and they share the gospel, and the person becomes a Christian right away. We, we hear about people instantly convert, and we think, oh, it's a, it's a one-time shot. Like, I can't do that. I don't have that gift. But the reality is that most people, especially today, aren't going to, be, aren't going to become Christians until there's a series of steps and barriers is removed. Like, I'll be honest with you, sometimes I struggle because you, you, know, you see me and, and others baptizing people all the time, and my fear is that, that you think that, well, this, I'm the only reason this person became a Christian. That's so far from the truth. Most of the time when a person talks to me, they've already had so many people in their life planting and watering and cultivating and weeding, and, and I just sometimes have the fortune to, to be the one to do the baptism. But there are many, many people who are involved in, in the process of a person coming to Christ. It takes multiple people most of the time to lead somebody to Christ. And so we need to kind of avoid this shock and awe confrontation where we throw the gospel at them and say, okay, you need to decide right now. And we need to lovingly work to just do what we can to remove one barrier at a time. Our goal isn't, isn't to knock all the barriers to belief down all at once. If that happens, that's great. And, and it does sometimes. But oftentimes it's far too much for people to process if they, if, they, if they don't have some time. And this is so, so important. Jesus didn't say to the woman, okay, like you've met me one time. You've heard what I had to say. Are you ready to follow me right now? He engaged her in a process. Then he said, hey, go back and get your husband. Bring him back. Let's talk about it some more. It was a, it was a process, not a one and done thing. Now, Lee Strobel, many of you have heard me mention his name before. He wrote a book several years ago called The Case for Christ. Best book I know for, for, for you and me and average Christians to read to know how to get, kind of eliminate some barriers that people have in their ability to believe in Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a great book, and I encourage you to read it. But the backstory of that book is that he knows these objections because he had them himself. For he himself was once an unbeliever, and he had many objections. And it was a long process of him becoming a Christian. And there were many people. There were many people watering and cultivating that seed. There was his wife. There were pastors. There were scholars and doctors who answered so many of his questions about the, 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 the reality and just the, how, how it all works. And, and yet by the time he became a Christian, he wrote this book, and, and it's so helpful to, to help us know, but it's, it's a process. And so we need to, like, have a part in that process. Our, our thing may not be to plant an initial seed. A lot of people have heard the gospel. Ours may be just be to, to, to just water, to water, to, to cultivate, to weed, to try to weed out some of those objections. You know, Chris, I'd... Like, I, I really would, I, I really want to believe, and I would believe, except for how, what's up with this? Or, or how does this work? Or why did, why did this happen, you know? We, we need to be able to kind of remove some of those barriers. Now, understand, like, you don't need to, you don't need to know everything. You don't need to feel like, well, I can't ever talk to somebody about the faith, because what if they ask me a question that I don't know the answer to? And I say, well, join the club. Like, I don't either. None of us do. But we ought to arm ourselves reasonably with the amount of, of information that will help us to do that. The other thing is, too, that when we, when we are doing this process, before, during, and after, and especially when we feel like somebody is, is getting close to becoming a Christian, we need to, if we haven't already, we need to start praying like crazy. 
He says in verse 2 of Colossians 4, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And this is to say that there is a battle going on at this point. Jesus said in Matthew 13, 19, when anybody hears the message about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. See, this is a spiritual battle. This is a, a spiritual fight. And so the only way we have to engage that is through word and through prayer. And Paul knew this. Paul knew that this world is a spiritual battle, and in it, prayer is the most important thing. And so I love the fact in the book of Ephesians, he goes down through this, we call it the, 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 the spiritual armor, and he talks about this, and he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. He says, For our struggle isn't against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He says, so therefore, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. We love that passage, but then right after that is, listen to what he says then. He says, also in addition, he says, be always praying in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, Always keep on praying for all of God's people. And then he says, and pray also for me that when I speak, words will be given that I may fearlessly proclaim the mystery of the gospel of which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I will declare it fearlessly as I should. That's very similar to what he, what he wrote in Colossians as well. But he was always asking the believers to pray for him in this regard. He wasn't asking them, hey, Hey, would you, would you pray that I get released from prison? Or, or would you pray that they, that they take it a little easier on me and don't, don't beat me so hard the next time? No. He was praying, hey, in the midst of this, help me to have an opening. Help me to, help me to, to know what to say. Help me to, to have the words to say. Pray that God will give me words that will communicate to them. It's prayer. See, I think prayer is the most talked about but the least practiced thing in the Christian faith. And yet that is where the battle for everything is fought, my friends. It isn't against flesh and blood. It's against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's where the spiritual struggle is. And amazing things happen when people pray. Moses prayed and a million people got manna to eat. Joshua prayed and the, and the sun stood still. The early church prayed for two times Peter was in prison and he was released. It said that Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for, for him. I, I love the story, and some of you might have heard this. It's an old one, uh, sort of a, a, a hero in our churches, a guy many years ago named J. Russell Morris. He was a, a missionary to Burma for many years. But at one point when the communists overtook Burma, he and many, many other missionaries were arrested, and they were taken to concentration camps because they were being accused of being American spies. And so he was in this concentration camp, in this dungeon for over two years, and Christians were praying for him. But eventually, there was a group of Christians in California in a little, little church named Sunset Christian Church. And they decided that they were going to pray for J. Russell Morris, and they were going to pray him out of prison. And so they didn't just have like a prayer for him each Sunday. They organized a month-long prayer vigil for him. And this was an amazing thing for them to pull off the small church. He didn't know this was going on for him. And unbeknownst to him, on the last day of their month-long prayer vigil, he got one of the communist soldiers came into a cell with a gun, pointed at him and said, okay, let's go. He talks about how he thought he was going to be executed. But they got outside and the soldier said to him, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm letting you go free. You're free to go. And he walked away. Now, like, you, you can say that's a coincidence. You can say, well, I've never seen anything like that before, Chris. Well, there's probably a reason for that because we don't pray like that anymore. But whether it's the, the power of prayer for a, a person that we're trying to lead to the Lord or whatever it might be, there's power in prayer. The other thing, too, and, and I don't mean to, to disqualify this because I mentioned earlier, but there, there does come a point. There does come a point where we do need to ask somebody, hey, do you want to, do you want to become a Christian? You've heard, you've heard all this stuff. You've had this people influencing you. I've, you know, there's come a point where some of us have to ask them to make a decision. Say, well, Chris, I don't know, I don't know how to do that. 
But see, this is the error of a lot of Christians. They assume that when, when people will just get it, like, like we, they come to church and they'll just sort of understand how everything works, there, there comes a point when we need to explain it to them as clearly as possible and ask them if they're ready to make a decision. Paul wrote in Colossians 4, 4, pray that I may, I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And so at this point, it's really, really good if you, like if you know how to help them and tell them to become a Christian and to take the next step. Do it with gentleness and respect. And there are a lot of ways that you can, a lot of things you can use, not a deck of cards or a phony bill, but there, there, there's a couple things. I'm going to show one of them to you, and you've seen it before. It's called the bridge illustration. I just want to go through this real quickly. Maybe you've seen this before. But it's a, a very simple way to help people understand the basic message of the Christian story. That God has created us to have a relationship with him. Like, like we know that. God's word tells us that. God's word also tells us that the first human beings, Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God. And they set in motion a whole process by which sin would enter the world. And we call this the fall. The fall of man. You want to know, friend, why things are so messed up in this world and why there's so much killing and violence and, and all this stuff is going on, even natural disasters and diseases. It's, it's because we live in a fallen world. It's sin has infected the whole world. Most of us are aware, the next one, most of us are aware of the separation. And so what we try to do is we try to, we try to do religion. Like we try to do things we can do to work our way back to God. But the Bible tells us there's nothing at all we can do. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. But then also the Bible tells us that our sin must be punished, that we can't exist in, in, in heaven with a holy God, that God cannot have sin in his presence. And, and so thankfully he did something about it because the wages of sin is death, says Romans 6.23. And then we talk about what Jesus has done for us, that Jesus is the one who spanned the gap between us and God. And this is the good news. This is the gospel. This is how God has provided us a way that we can have a relationship with him once again, that God became human. Everything Paul's been talking about, God became human, so, and he died on a cross and he became human in Jesus Christ. And Jesus died in our place. His death on the cross paid the penalty for our sins. It bridged the gap for our sins. And we might not be able to understand this sometimes intellectually, but this is what God's word tells us, that Jesus' death on the cross and our trust in him and belief in him and acceptance of him as our Lord and Savior, this bridges the gap created by our sin. And we need to, we need to accept Christ and then we talk about, you know, it's not just enough to know this intellectually, but we've got to cross the bridge. We've got to get to God. And the Bible tells us that there are some steps that we need to take, that God wants us to take. First of all, we need to believe. We need to believe. I think I've talked with you enough to know that you, you believe, right? Yeah, I, I believe. Well, the Bible also talks about how we need to repent. We need to be truly sorrowful for our sin and the things that we've done. And you've told me some things in, in your life that you've done and, and you didn't think God would ever want you because of X, Y, Z things you've done. But, but, but the Bible says that if we are truly sorry and repent for those things, then that, that's what we need to do. And then, then the Bible tells us to, to be baptized. And baptism is just a way that we, that we represent the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, that we're lowered down into the baptismal waters. No, they're not magic waters, but it's symbolic of how we leave our old life behind, our sins are left behind, and we arise a new person in Christ, just when, like when Christ walked out of the tomb, and he was a, a, a new person. He has defeated death. And, and so that, that is why we're to be baptized. The Bible also says that after we're baptized, we'll get the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the gift of the Holy Spirit can help you understand a lot more of these things as you go along and as you grow in the faith. But, but this is the basic gospel. So, so are you, like, what do you think? Are you, I think you're ready to be baptized, you think? And, and if they're not, still be their friends. Still love them. Don't just drop them. But there comes a point when, when we, need to, we need to ask people to make a decision. Because maybe time is running out on their life. We don't know. We don't know what will happen. But we do believe the Bible is very clear that there's a thing called hell. Jesus talked almost more about hell than anything else. So he believed in its reality. And we need to believe in it as well. So we need to, we need to be able to do this with gentleness and respect. We need to engage people and love them. 
But in the very end, in the very final thing, if you, if you don't think that you know how to do anything or can answer any question or know where whatever's at in the Bible or lead them through the, the bridge illustration or the four spiritual laws with some modifications, there's one thing you can do, Christian. You can just, you just tell them your story. You can just tell them what God has done for you, what God has done in your life, the difference God made in your life. And so this is why Peter writes in his, in his letter, hey, always be ready to, to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. He doesn't say, hey, always be ready to answer every question they have about the Bible. No, he says, always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for your hope. The thing about it is, Nobody can argue with you about your hope. Nobody can argue about your story. Nobody can say, no, God didn't really do that in your life. Oh, yeah, he can. Paul told people constantly how God intervened in his life. There was a man who was born blind. Jesus healed him, and the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus uh, after him, and so they were questioning this man, and finally they, they asked this man a question. He said, well, he said, I don't know. Like, I don't know if he's a prophet or what he is. All I know is that I was blind, but now I see that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. They said to the, said to the lady, we don't, we don't believe just because of what you said when she went back to tell the people. She says, now we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. See, it's all about, it's all about your story. It's all about, well, I was at this place in my life, or, 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 hey, my life was great, but I just realized there was something missing, and I started reading the Bible, or I went to church, or somebody talked to me about Christ, and, and up until that time, I'd never really known that God was real. I'd never had anybody that I trusted tell me about Jesus, but my friend did, and now I'm going through this, and I think, you know, just tell them your story. Sometimes. Sometimes we're going to be the ones to plant that initial seed of faith in people, and that's exciting. Other times, we may be the ones to water and cultivate and maybe weed out some objections. Other times, other times we're going to be the ones to witness the coming to faith and to their baptism and maybe even baptizing themselves, them ourselves. But the thing that we've got to remember is that it's God who does it all. So we need to focus on him. We need to turn it back to him, and we need to give him all the glory, and we need to be constant in prayer that he will give us opportunities to share the reason for the hope that we have.